Well, here we are with our Sunday School lesson for July the 24th. And I hope that you're having a, a good week, having a good summer. And uh, gosh, I'll tell you what, it, we are certainly in the middle of a heat wave and we're all experiencing that. And, and we give thanks for air conditioning. I can well remember that the day when we didn't have air conditioning in a house, but I'm certainly glad that we've got it now. We've been navigating through this, this series of lessons about the beginning of the church, um, the book of Acts, and I, I find it fascinating, and I've said that many times, because I think about this movement that we're part of today, this movement called Christianity. And, and when we go back and look at the very beginnings of the church, I can only imagine what that must have been like for that, that small group of, of apostles, that, that small group that followed Jesus, that followed God on earth and listened to the teachings and listened to the messages and watched the miracles and watched the interaction. And then it was left to them. And, and I find it fascinating when we look at that, at some of the things they experienced and how the, how the church developed. Last week, our lesson, uh, we talked about Peter, and, and Peter, who was a very staunch Jew. He, he, he was very uh, steeped in the faith, the Judaism faith. He, he, he was very vocal about his beliefs, and, and then he had this, this experience where when Cornelius called for him, and, and he had this vision. Uh, he, he was praying and he saw this sheet come down with all these different types of animals and he got this message from God that, that everybody, everybody was to be included uh, and, and had the ability to, to receive salvation. And it was a turning point for him. It was a turning point in his faith when he shared that and the Gentiles, the people that were on the outside, when he shared that message with him, the message of the Holy Spirit. They got excited because they were included. They were included in God's favor. And, and that was something that they had never, never felt before. They had been treated as outsiders by the Jews. And, and as we go through life, there, there's events like that. There's events that are, that are life-changing events. We all experience them. Sometimes we don't think about it. I happen to personally be a, a person that I don't believe in random events. As I look back through my life, as I look back through various things in my life, experiences that I've had, situations that I've been in, I can't help but believe that God was not responsible, that God was not part of those decisions that were being made. Even though I may not have realized it at the time, and yet they were life-changing moments. And you've all had that. Everybody that is listening to this today, if you take time to sit and reflect back through your life, Back, back through different events in your life, there have been times when you look back that you, you can't help but believe that God wasn't involved. I think about, and just to share a couple very quickly, I mean, the, the very fact that I'm here, that in, in the banking world, I was, a, I was a banker, I was a corporate lender, a commercial banker, and there's an organization called Robert Morris Associates, uh, Robert Morris Associates, and it's a trade organization and it is uh, a credit policy um, organization. And I was going through the chairs, going to become president of the local chapter in, in Dayton. And we had a fella come who was going to be national president of RMA to speak to our chapter. And after he got done speaking, he and I visited for a few minutes. His name happened to be Mal Murray. And, and Mal was from Charlotte, and he was head of credit policy for First Union Bank. And he said, I would like to have you consider sending your resume to me because we are hiring bankers uh, in Charlotte. And I said, well, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that you would, you would think that much of me, think that highly of me. And so I did. And I sent a resume to him. I sent a resume to Hugh McCall at NCNB. And it was because of that that I ultimately moved to Charlotte. I was offered a job uh, by interview by, by Hugh McCall and also by, by First Union and I made the decision to come to, to NCMB which as you know is now Bank of America. But what's even more interesting is that Mal Murray is a member of Bethel, Bethel Church in Cornelius, North Carolina. And I've shared that story with him more than once. That had it not been for that interaction, that it had not been for that few minutes together, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be living here today. 
And, and there have been many events in my life that, that I could say the same thing. They're watershed moments. They're, they're moments that changed my life, that changed the course that I was on at the time. So when we look at our lesson today, as I say, last week we talked about Peter being summoned by Cornelius. And, and, and he had this vision. Today's story of the First Church Council of Jerusalem is also such an event. Our lesson is titled, The Jerusalem Council's Mandate. The focal passage comes from Acts 15, and the purpose statement is to learn how the early church's quest for unity can help shape our struggles today. Now, when we think about the council. We think about the church council. We can't help but think about our own committees, our, our, our structure. And I got to say that it's important for every organization to have some sort of a structure, to have, have some sort of a framework in which they live by. Because if you don't, you just, you just don't go anywhere. You need the opportunity to be able to come together, to share ideas, to discuss issues. And if you think about the period of time that we're talking about here, the decision to allow Gentiles into this new, growing Christian community without requiring them to observe all the traditional Jewish laws was groundbreaking. I mean, it was something that, that would absolutely change the face of religion. But because the council met and made the decisions they made, Christianity became the dominant religion in the world. Now, I'm going to read the lesson from the message, and I'm going to read from the message that's written by Eugene, or not written, but transcribed by Eugene Peterson. And the message takes the Bible and puts it into very contemporary terms, terms that we have a, a, an easier ability to understand. I think this particular passage, it's even more so because it tells the story in a way that you could actually put your mind into committees that you've been on. So we read from chapter 15. And it says, it wasn't long before some Jews showed up from Judea, insisting that everyone be circumcised. If you're not circumcised in the Mosaic fashion, you can't be saved. And Paul and Barnabas were up on their feet at once in fierce protest. The church decided to resolve the matter by sending Paul, Barnabas, and a few others to put it before the apostles and leaders in Jerusalem. After they were sent off and on their way, they told everyone they met as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria about the breakthrough to the Gentile outsiders. Everyone who heard the news cheered. It was terrific news. When they got to Jerusalem, Paul and Barnabas were graciously received by the whole church, including the apostles and leaders. They reported on their recent journey and how God had used them to open things up to the outsiders. Some Pharisees stood up to say their peace. They had become believers, but continued to hold to the hard party line of the Pharisees. You have to circumcise the pagan converts, they said. You must make them keep the law of Moses. The apostles and leaders called a special meeting to consider the matter. The arguments went on and on, back and forth, getting more and more heated. Then Peter took the floor. Friends, you well know that from early on, God made it quite plain that he wanted the pagans to hear the message of this good news and embrace it. And not in any second-hand or roundabout way, but first-hand, straight from my mouth. And God, who can't be fooled by any pretense on our part, but always knows a person's thoughts, gave them the Holy Spirit as exactly as he gave him to us. He treated the outsiders exactly as he treated us, beginning at the very center of, they, of who they were and working from that center outward, cleaning up their lives as they trusted and believed in him. So why are you now trying to out-God God, loading these new believers down with rules that crushed our ancestors and crushed us too? Don't we believe that we are saved because the Master Jesus amazingly and out of sheer generosity moved to save us just as he did those from beyond our nation? So what are we arguing about? There was dead silence. No one said a word. With the room quiet, Barnabas and Paul reported matter-of-factly on the miracles and wonders God had done among the other nations through their ministry. The silence deepened. You could hear a pin drop. And James, who we recognize as the brother of Jesus, broke the silence. Friends, listen. 
Simeon has told us the story of how God at the very outset made sure that racial outsiders were included. This is in perfect agreement with the words of the prophets. After this, I'm coming back. I'll rebuild David's ruined house. I'll put the pieces together again. I'll make it look like new. So outsiders who seek will find so they'll have a place to come to. All the pagan peoples included in what I'm doing. God said it. Now he's doing it. It's no afterthought. He's always known he would do this. So here is my decision. We're not going to unnecessarily burden non-Jewish people whom turn to the master. We'll write them a letter and tell them, be careful to not get involved in activities connected with idols, to guard the morality of sex and marriage, to not serve food offensive to Jewish Christians, blood for instance. This is basic wisdom from Moses preached and honored for centuries, now in city after city as we have met and kept the Sabbath. Now doesn't that sound like committees that you've been on? Doesn't that sound like different organizations that you've been in when you, when you couldn't come to a group and you said, okay, we're going to meet later, we're going to have another meeting, we're going to have a smaller group to talk about it? You can just feel this, this, this tone. And, and, and the tone was one of reconciliation. The tone of it was one of the people coming together and saying, we need to resolve this problem because this is what God wants. We're not God. We have to follow what God wants for us. And so when I look at this, when I read this lesson, when I reflect on this lesson as I've been preparing it, my, my takeaway from it are, are, are basically four things to think about. First of all, God knows our heart. One of the first affirmations of the Council of Jerusalem is that God knows our hearts. Peter, in his testimony before the Council, made it abundantly clear. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. We're not like God. We look at people, we judge them. We talked about that last week. We judge them just simply by their appearance. Sometimes we judge them by their actions, the way they walk, the way they talk, the way they act. But like the Pharisee Christians, when we do judge, our, judge is not, our judgment is not gentle. The Pharisees felt that the new Gentile Christians needed to attain their level of holiness which they believe was attained by being circumcised and by following these hundreds of laws that they had. But God saw into the heart of the Gentiles. And what God saw was that the Gentiles were God's creation and God's people. And because of that and that alone, they were worthy of God's love and forgiveness. And without hesitation, God filled the Gentiles with the Holy Spirit. We're also reminded as we look at this lesson that we can't do it. Peter reminds the council that the law given to the Israelites through Moses was too great to bear. They couldn't do it. They weren't doing it. The Jews were never, never able to completely fulfill all of the rules. So he says, now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing, placing on the neck of the disciples this yoke that not even your ancestors could bear? And Peter should know. He tried to be a good follower of Jesus. Still, he ended up failing miserably. We remember, Peter denied Jesus three times. But it was only because of Jesus' love, his forgiveness, his grace, that Peter was able to rejoin the disciples and become one of the leaders of the church. I think we also pick up on the fact that we are saved by grace. Peter summed up his testimony by saying, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Grace saves us. And we ask the question, well, what, what does it save us from? Certainly we are saved for life after death. And salvation is so much more. Salvation is the freedom of living by faith in God's kingdom. We are free from living the lie that power equals greatness and that the earth is ours to do with whatever we want with it. Instead, we're free because of our faith, because of our belief, because of our salvation. We are free to live in a kingdom with love, service, 
and acceptance. We are able to experience that salvation now, and what a great gift that is. And then clearly we also pick up on the fact that salvation is for all. The council decided that the salvation given through Jesus Christ was a salvation for all people. No one was excluded from the work of Christ. And James, when he stood up, quoted the prophets, saying that they would rebuild the dwelling of David which had fallen. From its ruins I will rebuild it and I will set it up so that all other peoples may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles over whom my name has been called. The church was beginning to understand that the commission to be Jesus' witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth means that everyone was, not, was in and no one was left out. Our teacher commentary asked a simple question, and I, and I thought it was interesting. They asked it in the commentary that we share that as part of our lesson. And they said to ask, and we can reflect on it, we can reflect on it today, we can reflect on it this week. They asked the question, what is the purpose of the church? Now think about that. Think about in your life, I talk about these defining moments in our lives, during your life, what was your experience with the church? What was your understanding of what the purpose of the church was? Now we can think of all kinds of little, little things to serve, to serve each other, to serve the community, to serve the Lord, to, to come together and worship. But, but in, a, in a very deep sense, what is the true purpose of the church? And as we've been talking, each of us have this responsibility to live in the image of Jesus to believe as Jesus believed. One of the things that, that occurred early on in the church was the, the Nicene Creed. And, and the Nicene Creed in about the fifth century was, was modified a little bit to become the Apostles' Creed. And the Apostles' Creed is a creed that we share on a weekly basis. Many denominations share the same creed. When I think about my role when I think about what I believe, when I think about all of the, the, the discussions about theology, and, and, and we get into those, and I, I don't mind having a theology discussion with anybody from another denomination. But when we think about what we believe, and we say it, we repeat it. We say it in the form of the Apostles' Creed. And, and I'd like to share that, I'd like to have you think about that as, as we finish up this lesson today. When it comes right down to it and you remove all of the theology and you look at us just in the image of Christ, just as Christians, we believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. And the third day he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. When you think about our lives in those terms, when you think about our focus in those terms alone, you begin to change the way you look at the world and the way you approach the world. Will you pray with me, my friends? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for this lesson today. We give you thanks for these words. Because it is so important to stay focused when we think about the early church. We give thanks for the commitment of those apostles, for those people that stood firm, that listened. And now, today, we're here to carry on that message again. We just continue to say that, that, that we want you to keep our eyes open to the things you want us to see and our ears open to the things you want us to hear and our hearts overflowing with that love, that Holy Spirit that you have put in each and every one of us. In his name we pray. Amen. I love you, my friends, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.